Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, I'm Hillel Fratkin, a senior fellow of the Hudson Institute, and it's my very great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this very important conference on behalf of the Hudson Institute, our chairman, Sarah Stern, and uh, her colleagues and, and my own. The Hudson Institute was founded in 1961 by the strategist Herman Kahn. From the beginning, it has been devoted to the freedom, security, and prosperity of the United States and the health of its institutions. Its work has especially focused on strategies for the long term, strategies that thus deal with our most abiding challenges. In its research, it draws upon a wide variety of perspectives and opinions, and it will do so today. And it covers a wide variety of policy areas, domestic, foreign, and national security. Let me, first of all, th uh, in addition, thank you all for being here and participating in this conference. I said before that this conference is important. It is so for two reasons. First, its subject, and second, the personnel that will address it. Our subject is countering violent extremism, Qatar, Iran, and the Muslim Brotherhood. We will, of course, explore each of these topics, but also the overlap between them. Now, I hardly need stress the importance of the subject of violent extremism emanating from the Muslim world. Its gravity has been evident to the American public ever since September 11th, 2001, when so many thousands of our fellow citizens lost their lives. And as General Kelly so movingly reminded us last week, countering this threat is still taking American lives in many places around the world, most recently in West Africa. Nor do I need to stress that it has also had many other effects on our way of life, some big, some small. At this point, we all know that. But what I may stress and should stress is that the character of the threat has its own dynamics and has evolved over time. For example, the, revolt, the Arab revolts of 2011 created additional dynamics that affected and still affect the terrain of this problem. Its consequences included the rise of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, opportunities for the depredations of the Islamic Republic of Iran, as well as further opportunities for their regional enablers. The purpose of this conference is to address the present phase of these dynamics and its future. Where are we now and where are we headed? Where should we be headed if we're not headed in the right direction? To address these crucial questions, this conference brings together a most distinguished group of participants. This is the second reason for the significance of this conference. Our, our participants, in their public and private capacities, bring to bear a vast amount of experience, very hard experience, often, and thought about this grievous problem. We will begin with Leon Panetta, a man who has, everyone knows, given lifelong and distinguished service to our country as a congressman, as Secretary of Defense, and as Director of the CIA. In all those capacities and several others, he really seems to be indefatigable if you look at his resume, he has wrestled with the problems we are here to discuss. He will deliver his thoughts in conversation with Lally Weymouth. Ms. Weymouth has also had a very distinguished career and one that has also involved great public service. Ms. Weymouth has been a senior editor of the Washington Post since 1986. In that capacity, she has performed the invaluable service of helping the American public understand the problem, problems we face and the officials who are tasked with that purpose, and sometimes the people who are causing the problem themselves. I think back to an interview that 
Miss Weymouth did of uh, Muammar Gaddafi some years ago. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Panetta and Lolly Weymouth. So good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. On behalf of the Hudson Institute, to what I hope will be a fascinating afternoon. And um, it starts off with Leon Panetta, whom I'm sure we will all be fascinated to hear from, considering the number of crises that are going on all over the world today. So Leon, I can't uh, help but ask you, first of all, North Korea. How do you see the situation? Do you think we're close to war? How do you assess North Korea? Well, first of all, uh, my thanks to the Hudson Institute for uh, uh, inviting me here and uh, for having this opportunity. Look, uh, we're, we're living in a world where there are a huge number of flashpoints uh, and danger points, probably more more flashpoints than we've seen since the end of World War II. Uh, failed states in the Middle East, uh, ISIS, the war against terrorism, uh, Iran and their continuing support for terrorism, uh, North Korea, Russia, China, cyber attacks. I mean, this is a, uh, this is a dangerous world. Uh, and it, uh, it demands very strong U.S. leadership. So it, it obviously is a challenging time for, uh, for U.S. leadership because of these danger points, and we're seeing that with, uh, with North Korea. Uh, North Korea has been a difficult challenge uh, for a very long time uh, and has been a rogue nation and mm -hmm. obviously a nation where we've been extremely concerned mm -hmm. about their ability to develop uh, nuclear weapons uh, and an ICBM, uh, which they seem to be making great progress on. Uh, and I think, according to intelligence analysis, we're probably looking at uh, not that many months mm -hmm. before they, in fact, develop uh, both an ICBM capability mm -hmm. and a, a miniaturized nuclear weapon that could be placed on top of an ICBM. So the issue then becomes, uh, you know, how do we, how do we confront this, uh, this challenge to our national security? Uh, the reality is that uh, there have been military plans that have been developed over the years uh, to try to confront North Korea. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, None of those are very good options because of the consequences mm -hmm. and the concern that uh, ultimately it could lead not only to uh, many lives, thousands of lives that are lost in South Korea, mm -hmm. but also could lead ultimately to a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for that reason, uh, you know, the, the issue has always been how do you try to engage North Korea? And, Obviously, the effort has been made uh, to try to put pressure on China uh, because uh, China is the one country that has uh, large influence uh, in North Korea to try to get them to uh, try to deal with North Korea and get them to negotiate. Uh, that has not proven very effective. So what, what are we left with? I think in the end, the United States has to implement a policy of containment and deterrence, uh, which is the approach we've been taking. But I think that in some ways that noose of containment and deterrence has to be tightened. I think we have to obviously increase uh, our military presence and strength in the region. Uh, we have to increase our Navy presence. We have to continue to uh, support uh, and develop the security of uh, South Korea as well as Japan. We need to develop a missile shield, an effective missile shield uh, that can uh, bring these missiles down uh, in South Korea, in Japan, 
uh, obviously in our country, in terms of uh, the threat of ICBMs. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to continue to toughen sanctions. Mm -hmm. And I do think that if China is willing to uh, restrict oil shipments uh, and deal with some of the other commercial areas that they deal with in North Korea, that it can have an impact uh, on the North Korean economy. So tightening up those sanctions mm -hmm. and then at the same time, uh, working with our allies, working with China, try to see if we can't work towards some kind of negotiations with North Korea. This is not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, we've experienced that. But I think we need to push as hard as we can on the policy of deterrence and containment and try to put as much pressure on North Korea as possible, recognizing that uh, if something were to happen, we have to be prepared to obviously confront that. And also, I might mention developing both our overt and covert capabilities mm -hmm. to try to deal uh, with uh, their efforts to try to uh, develop uh, a larger and more effective missile system. Mm -hmm. How do you think the administration is doing in dealing with North Korea? I think uh, you know, the concern is that uh, there's been this exchange of rhetoric uh, between uh, President Trump uh, and the North Korean leader. Uh, the concern I have is when you ratchet up the rhetoric mm -hmm. uh, between fire and fury and you know, destroying the United States, et cetera. What it does is it increases the tension level in, uh, in Korea. And you have to imagine that there are forces, we have 25,000 uh, troops that are in South Korea, along with the South Korean uh, security force. Uh, the North Koreans obviously have uh, forces that are deployed along the border. Uh, and you know, they're, they're in a situation where, because of the rhetoric, uh, the tension uh, has risen a great deal. Mm -hmm. And with that tension is the concern about a miscalculation or a mistake mm -hmm. that will ultimately escalate into a greater conflict. And so my concern right now is that it would be far better to uh, lower the volume of rhetoric and focus on developing both our strength and capacity in the region, uh, developing better containment, developing greater deterrence, uh, and trying to uh, deal with uh, sanctions that can really have an impact on North Korea uh, and impact on their economy. The main reason we ultimately brought Iran to the negotiating table was because of worldwide sanctions mm -hmm. that were put in place against Iran. I think we have to think in the same way about doing that to North Korea. So speaking of Iran, do you, did you feel that President Trump's threat last week to not certify the Iran um, uh, bill was a mistake? And what did you think of his reasoning? His basically saying that Iran was not complying with the accord, that it was behaving very aggressively, that it was restricting navigation, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, in, in foreign policy, uh, in defense policy, uh, in many ways, your word counts for a lot. And when you tell somebody that you're going to do something, uh, if you fail to stick to your word, it sends a clear message to others that as a result of that, uh, you cannot trust America as a partner. Uh, in many ways, you know, we experienced that uh, when uh, President Obama made the commitment on chemical mm -hmm. attacks in, uh, Syria. Uh, in Syria with Assad, that if those chemical attacks took place, we would take action. And when those chemical attacks did take place, uh, and many, uh, many were lost as a result of that. Uh, the failure to actually take action at that time uh, sent a message that uh, we would not stand by the word on the red line. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, had an impact in mm -hmm. terms of uh, credibility of the United States and the world. 
I think the same thing's happening now uh, with the uh, failure to abide by our word on the agreement. Now, obviously, there are a lot of, a lot of concerns about uh, the nuclear agreement, uh, the failure to deal with these other issues, uh, support for terrorism, missile development, mm -hmm. uh, promotion of instability in the region, uh, et cetera. Uh, but uh, an agreement was, uh, was arrived at by the United States along with our allies, and it was signed into place. And up to this point, uh, the agreement dealing with the nuclear side, even though temporary, is one that uh, all of those that have you know, been involved in the inspection process uh, have said that uh, from an inspection point of view, Iran is technically abiding by that uh, agreement. Uh, and you know, we can raise a lot of concerns about uh, other elements there, but uh, at least with regards to the development of uh, a nuclear weapon, they have abided by that agreement. I think, I think as a result of that, we ought to continue to enforce that agreement. Mm -hmm. And I think Congress uh, you know, can add, obviously, uh, this issue has now been thrown to Congress. Mm -hmm. I'm a little concerned about that because Congress is having a hard time sometimes finding its way to the bathroom, much less uh, <laughs> dealing with uh, issues that involve uh, an area, frankly, that the commander in chief, as uh, someone who ought to direct foreign policy under our system of government, that I think you know, far better for the administration, for the president, to deal with these issues. But since the issue has now been thrown to the Congress, then I think uh, Congress should hopefully develop a way to uh, increase uh, the enforcement of that agreement, uh, tie sanctions to the enforcement of it, uh, try to probably make some other recommendations about trying to take these provisions and make them permanent as opposed to temporary, uh, and some other steps with regards to inspection. But, but in the end, to make clear that we're going to continue to enforce that agreement, because by enforcing that agreement, I think it then gives us the opportunity to work with our allies in trying to apply both diplomatic and economic sanctions on Iran so that they will ultimately come to the table and negotiate on these other issues. That's not going to be easy under any circumstances. But the worst thing you can do is break your word, have Iran basically say, why should, why should I trust the United States? Mm -hmm in terms of any kind of negotiation if they're not abiding mm -hmm. by the agreement. And therefore, you know, we're not going to, uh, we will not participate mm -hmm. in that kind of negotiation. So I think it's far better enforce the agreement, mm -hmm. stick with our allies, and try to put both diplomatic and economic pressure on Iran to ultimately try to see if we can make some progress on these other issues. Well, that was very interesting. Now, how do you feel about <laughs> Iran's actions in the area? And don't you think the, or do you think the United States should be taking strong actions to contain Iran? They've actually already turned Lebanon, I would say, into more or less a rubber stamp in the sense yeah. that Hezbollah controls Lebanon, as our audience knows. And I think that, uh, many people think that they would like to do the same thing now in Iraq, thanks to the uh, uh, militias there. So do you think it's important for the United States to try and push back and contain Iran? Look, there, there are two important you know, threats in the Middle East. I mean, the Middle East uh, has a number of threats. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got uh, failed states uh, coming out of Arab Spring mm -hmm. uh, between uh, Syria, which just mm -hmm. uh, is, in, is in the middle of a continuing civil war. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Yemen, we have Libya, mm -hmm. other countries uh, that, uh, because of their failure, become crucibles for the development of terrorism. Uh, and that creates uh, even greater problems. Uh, so instability, failed states in the Middle East, uh, we're certainly concerned about. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're concerned about terrorism uh, and the threat of terrorism. ISIS, uh, it, you know, we've, we've had some success in dealing with ISIS in the caliphate, uh, moving them out of Mosul, uh, moving them out of the areas uh, in Iraq uh, that they had uh, conquered. Uh, as well as Raqqa now, but by no means is ISIS going away. Uh, and uh, you know, the worst thing the United States could do is to declare victory uh, and then not confront ISIS uh, in, in other areas. So 
dealing with ISIS. I, I, you know, ISIS fighters are moving to the eastern part of Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very likely to now engage in insurgency uh, and uh, we'll see elements of ISIS not only uh, in the Middle East but North Africa as well. Uh, and so ISIS is going to remain a real threat uh, and we have to confront ISIS. And we have to confront uh, the uh, influence of Iran in that region as well. Uh, Iran uh, provides uh, support for terrorism. Uh, they've supported Hamas and Hezbollah uh, and uh, supported uh, uh, elements uh, of, uh, of disruption mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Uh, we know that. They continue to do that. They continue to try to promote instability in the region. Uh, their interest is to try to uh, develop uh, a kind of uh, triangle there between uh, Beirut and Damascus and Baghdad. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know, uh, we know that they're working on that. The Quds Force obviously is a force that has been involved in disrupting uh, areas, not only in the Middle East, but frankly elsewhere around the world. So, yeah, that, that represents a threat as well. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with that? That's obviously the fundamental issue. I, I believe, and I made this recommendation a lot, but it just, it unfortunately, didn't, didn't get very far. <laughs> but I, I, really, I strongly believe we have to develop a coalition, a Middle East coalition of countries that will work together in cohesion. Uh, Israel can, should be part of that coalition, frankly, because they too are concerned about uh, ISIS and terrorism and Iran. Uh, and that coalition, made up of moderate Arab countries in the region, uh, ought to be coming together to establish uh, even a joint military command, uh, identify targets, deploy forces, uh, be able to work together uh, with the United States as part of that coalition, uh, work together to go after terrorist pockets uh, and go after uh, the leadership uh, in terrorism uh, in different, different areas using kind of tactics that frankly, when we, went, when we uh, did the war in Libya, we had 50 countries that were part of that coalition. Uh, and a lot of people you know, were not sure whether that coalition would ever work, but the reality was we developed a joint headquarters in Naples. They, we provided uh, the intelligence support. We identified targets. We provided those targets to uh, Norway and other countries that were participating, and we did it in a successful and effective way. I think we need to develop that same kind of coalition in the Middle East to have that kind of capability, not only to deal with ISIS, but to deal with containing Iran at the same time. Hmm. And also, I might add one other aspect, which is providing stability for countries that are unstable now. I mean, you know, the United States, uh, we never really had a strategy for dealing with the Arab Spring. And I think what needs to be done now is once we're able to try to deal with some of these failed states in terms of the instability, how do you stabilize these countries? How do you provide the support system so that they can govern uh, and so that they can uh, deal with uh, the different challenges in each of these countries? Look, these are tribal societies. This is tough. This is not easy. But at the same time, if we don't work to provide stability in that region, then it will continue to be unstable and will continue to have to deal with the terrorist threat. So I think ultimately some kind of unified coalition working together on these challenges makes a lot of sense. Um, this past week, as you noted, uh, Raqqa fell, and also, which was a very hopeful development, and unfortunately, there was fighting in Kirkuk between the Pashmirga forces and the Iraqi military, which was a, not, it was a concerning development, I would say. What is your assessment of the um, situation in Kirkuk and the? Well, look, it's, it's not good. It's not, this is not a good situation. 
uh, to have uh, you know, Arab versus Kurd, uh, particularly in Iraq. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, look, we, we've been dealing with this challenge for a long time. Uh, and there was even suggestions early on when we were dealing with uh, the situation in Iraq that Iraq ought to be divided uh, between Sunni and Shia and Kurds. And I remember going to Iraq uh, and talking with the leadership there. And almost, I think without question, every leader I talked to said, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Iraq is a nation. We need to operate as a nation. Uh, and, you know, we, we put in place some of the institutions uh, to try to develop some kind of, of governmental system in Iraq. Uh, to make it work, everybody's got to participate. The Kurds have to be there. The Sunnis have to be there. The Shias, of course, will be there. But, but they've got to develop the ability to work together and deal with issues. And what happened, obviously, in Iraq is that uh, you had a Shia uh, government with uh, Maliki, who basically decided uh, that they were going to get, you know, move the Sunnis out. And so they moved the Sunnis out of government, they moved the Sunnis out of the military, and before you knew it, it became, frankly, the ingredients that led to, to the development of ISIS. Uh, unless they develop the ability to bring the different factions in Iraq together so that they can govern together. I mean, this is a country that's got tremendous resources, for God's sakes. It's not a country that has to worry about, you know, how are we going to be able to fund uh, economic development? They can do it. But they've got to work together at it. And I think, you know, if, if Sunnis or if Sunnis fight Shias, and if Shias fight Kurds, and, and they continue to have this kind of disruption, then Iraq will never be able to uh, achieve stability. Now, I was pleased that uh, Secretary Tillerson uh, was in Saudi Arabia and promoting greater Saudi-Iraq uh, relationships uh, to try to bolster uh, Iraq and try to limit Iranian influence uh, in uh, Iraq. I think that's a good step. Uh, but what is needed here is for the United States to continue to push uh, the government there to develop the opportunity to bring the Kurds and the Sunnis mm -hmm. into the government to be able to work with them in a unified Iraq. That's ultimately what you want. Not going to be easy. You know, we've been through a lot. The Kurds, uh, look, the Kurds have, you know, we've supported the Kurds. The Kurds have uh, fought some great battles on, on behalf of the United States. Uh, they've sacrificed a lot, uh, but so have others. And the time has come now where they have to make a fundamental decision. Do they want to be part of a country like Iraq, or are they going to continue to kind of try to go off on their own. Uh, this is not, you know, this, this is going to be a challenge, but I, I worry that if the Iraqis keep going after uh, the Kurds, that we'll have another civil war on our hands and, in that region, and we sure as hell don't need that. And isn't Iran, I, I read reports that General Soleimani of Iran was in Kirkuk last week, so it looks like we've left the Kurds at the hands, or in the hands of the Iranians. Should the U.S. be more active in resolving no, this I th dispute? I look, there's no question. We, we left Iraq, and it created a vacuum uh -huh. that, uh, in which uh, Iran and others uh, took advantage of it. Uh, and we can't afford to do that. Uh, we have troops there. We've helped develop their security forces. We developed a very effective security force that went after Mosul, went after the other territories that were conquered by ISIS. Uh, I think the United States needs to remain there mm -hmm. and to continue to put pressure on the government.
to try to resolve these other issues. Otherwise, if, if we're not there, make no mistake about it, Iran will be there. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it appears as if the uh, Trump administration is satisfied with trying to defeat ISIS in uh, Syria, but leaving President Assad in power. I wondered if you felt this was a satisfactory solution to the terrible bloodshed that's been going no, on look, in I, Syria. I think that Assad remaining in power in Syria is a prescription for continuing civil war and instability in Syria. Uh, that what needs to be done is that the elements that are there, and now we've got Syrian forces who just were able to uh, take over a, an important oil area uh, in Syria. You've got Kurdish uh, forces there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got U.S. forces there. We've got Russians. We've got Iranians. We've got Syrians. Uh, you know, this. Right now, I think we are looking at a continuing civil war, and it all—it's almost going to be a proxy war, with the United States uh, obviously supporting uh, opposition forces, Syrian and Kurdish. Uh, and Iran and Russia supporting Assad. Uh, so we, we've got a proxy war that's going to continue to go on. And the real question is going to be whether or not at some point there's a willingness to sit down and to try to see if they can't find a, a peaceful solution. We've tried. Uh, it hasn't gone very far. Uh, as long as somebody thinks they're winning, uh, it's tough to do this. Uh, and Assad right now probably figures he's winning mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Russian help and Iranian help. Uh, but I think the United States has to be a force there. I don't think the United States can write off Syria. I think the United States has to be a force uh, in working with the opposition, mm -hmm. in working with the forces that are there, and in making clear that the United States is not going anywhere. We're not going to surrender Syria to Russia and Iran. Mm -hmm. We need to be there. We need to uh, play a role in working with these other forces to try to ultimately be a checkpoint, if nothing else, to force some kind of negotiation. Because as far as I can re recollect, many, many years ago when Russia came into Egypt, Dr. Kissinger basically sat in the White House, didn't take their calls, uh, put on a high nuclear, near nuclear alert, and the Russians withdrew from the Middle East for almost 30 years. But then they marched right back into Syria, and the Obama administration, I have to say, did absolutely nothing, right? Said nothing, did nothing. And so I guess Putin, as usual, is testing the envelope to see how far he can go, and he stayed there, right? How, well, how influential do you think Russia is and how, in, in the Middle East right now? Well, look, Russia, I mean, the reason, which is, this is another flashpoint, which is that we are in a new chapter of the Cold War with Russia, mm -hmm. uh, and what Putin is doing and I, you know, Putin, in, in many ways, is an easy read mm -hmm. uh, from an intelligence point of view and from a point of view of uh, dealing with Putin. Mm -hmm. uh, Putin is about uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. Putin's uh, basic goal is to restore the states of the old Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that, that's always been his intent. Mm -hmm. he, he thought that... Uh, you know, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, that, that was the greatest tragedy Russia mm -hmm. has experienced uh, in its history. And so Putin is basically aiming at that. But, and, and what, what Putin will do is if he reads weakness mm -hmm. in his opposition, he'll take advantage of it. That's what bullies do. They will take advantage of if they, if they do not think that the other side will respond, then they will continue to take advantage of it. And so that's what, what he did in Crimea. That's why he went into the Ukraine. Uh, he was not uh, in any way really checked in that advance there. Uh, and sensing uh, weakness again, he went into uh, Syria uh, and uh, was not checked there. And so uh, the reality is that uh, Putin is going to continue to uh, exert an influence. Uh, now that he's, you know, they've, they've got a few thousand uh, troops that are located in Syria, along with uh, their air force. 
they've got a substantial military presence. Uh, I think it has to be made clear that, uh, uh, that we are not going to surrender the Middle East to Russia, mm -hmm. uh, that we have to play a role. And it means drawing lines, it means drawing lines, or, or trying to make sure that uh, they do not uh, uh, develop this relationship with Iran in order to uh, expand their influence in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, you have to draw lines, and then you have to stick to those lines. Mm -hmm. You got to make very clear to Russia that they cannot uh, go into any of their uh, border states and do what they did to the Ukraine. And that if they do that, we are going to, uh, obviously with NATO, uh, enforce Article 5. And that uh, with regards to the Middle East, that we are going to limit uh, their ability to uh, expand their influence in the Middle East. We've got to make that clear, and then you've got to back it up. And if you do that, he'll respond. Very frankly, that's the way you deal with Putin. Uh, if you're not tough with Putin, if he doesn't understand where the lines are, he will continue to take advantage of it. And I think for that reason, it's very important for the United States to make very clear that there are lines that he cannot cross, both in the Middle East as well as in Europe. And how do you think the administration's doing with Russia? Not so good. <laughs> I think you got to, I think you have to make, you have to make those points clear. Yeah. You know, we know, we know what Russia's up to. It's not, you know, what, what they tried to do here in the United States in uh, trying to impact uh, our election process uh, was a cyber attack on the United States. Let's face it. This was a cyber attack against our most valuable institution, which is the, the right of American people to exercise their right to vote in an election. And they tried to go after that. Uh, and obviously, we're now trying to determine just how extensive that was and how we can hopefully avoid that in the future. But you, gotta send, you have to send a clear message to the Russians that uh, because of their aggressiveness in the Ukraine, in Syria, and against the United States, that the United States is not simply going to sit back mm -hmm. and allow that to continue. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot just hope that at some point they'll be nice guys. Mm -hmm. That's not the way it works. Mm. You've got to be able to be very tough with them and make sure that when you say something is going to happen, you damn well stick to it. And if, that, if you do that, look, I, I, I'm not one that thinks you can't negotiate with Putin. Yes, you can negotiate with Putin. We've done that. And we've had some success in the past in negotiating agreements with the Russians. But you have to do that from strength, not from weakness. Well, that was certainly interesting. So um, in wrapping up here, I guess um, a lot of this conference is supposed to be about um, uh, there been, of course, the uh, GCC has been freed by the dispute between Qatar and Saudi Arabia and the UAE. I wondered if you think the U.S. should be more involved in resolving this dispute or what, what you think should happen and how important our air base is or, yeah. uh, to the United States. Well, you know, in, in addition to the other threats that I pointed out in the <laughs> Middle East, uh, there are divisions in the Middle East, uh -huh. historic divisions. Uh, you know, between uh, Arab and Jew, between Arab and Kurds, between uh, Arabs and Arabs, between Sunnis and Shias. Uh, and in many ways, those divisions have impacted on the ability to try to find uh, some degree of stability in the region. And so, obviously, if we're going to be able to make progress in the Middle East, then countries have to work towards the same objectives. They've got, to, you know, they've got to identify what is it that undermines stability in the Middle East. And what undermines stability in the Middle East, as I pointed out, is terrorism. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, all, all of that terrorism has undermined the ability of that region uh, and continues to do so. 
And so, you know, Gutter, frankly, has had a mixed record. We, we know they've provided uh, support, uh, financial support uh, for the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, for uh, terrorism, for Hamas, uh, for elements of Al Qaeda, the, the Taliban. Uh, and the problem is they can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in that region, you have some common enemies. One is terrorism, and frankly, the other is Iran. And you can't play both sides of the street. And I, th I think it's extremely important. Look, I, I think Gutter has now said that they want to abide by uh, international requirements uh, with regards to financing of terrorism. They've passed laws to try to implement uh, requirements against uh, financing of terrorism. Uh, they say that they want to do the right thing. I think the issue is now to make sure that what they say is what they do. And that means making sure that they are enforcing efforts to limit their support. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we have a defense agreement uh, with, uh, with Qatar. We have, an air, we have a base there, a pretty significant base mm -hmm. uh, involved in, in the wars in the, in the Middle East. Uh, they have been facilitators uh, when we've dealt uh, not only with uh, Iran, but with the Taliban. So yeah, there, there, you know, there has been some, some efforts to try to uh, work together. But you can't do this unless we know where you are. And in that world, you've got to be committed against terrorism. And you've got to make clear that you oppose uh, ISIS and other elements of terrorism, and that you're going to work with other countries in the region to make sure that uh, terrorism is not supported. Uh, and that, you know, that ultimately is the way to try to ultimately reach some kind of solution. I know that uh, the United States, Secretary Tillerson, are working on that. I know that Kuwait has provided some assistance to try to bring those parties together. But I think you really need to have a commitment by Gutter that they are, in fact, going to abide by what they say they're doing. In wrapping up, uh, I, I can't resist asking you, you've been around this town for a long time. You have a lot of experience. Yeah. And uh, as, as those as, people as said. As witness from the yeah, people the, in the audience. As they said, we're, we're <laughs> members of the, the establishment. I can't resist asking you, um, people in the so-called swamp uh, continually are wringing their hands and saying this um, town has never been more divided and politics have never been worse. Yeah. Uh, do you believe politics have never been more divided? Uh, do you, and how do you see the town, and how do you see this administration's uh, functioning? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real concern of mine. I, I, I have seen in my over 50-year career in public life, mm -hmm. I've seen Washington at its best, and I've seen Washington at its worst. Uh, the good news is I've seen Washington work. Uh, when I first came back as a legislative assistant to a Republican senator from California, Tom Kegel, uh, there were senators on the Republican side who worked with senators on the Democratic side to develop bipartisan solutions. Mm. And, they develop, and they passed landmark legislation. When I got elected to Congress, uh, Tip O'Neill was the speaker, Democrats Democrat from Massachusetts, but he had a good friend in Bob Michael who was uh, the minority leader. And they worked together. I mean, in the, in the Reagan administration, as an example, you know, you look at what's up there now in the Congress. We passed Social Security reform. We passed immigration reform. We passed tax reform. Bipartisan. Because we were willing to sit down and work together. I've never seen Washington as dysfunctional as it is today. Both parties are in the trenches. They don't want to come out and work together. Uh, and when they do, uh, they run into, uh, uh, into barriers of one kind or another. This country will only survive if our democracy is able to find consensus and compromise in working out solutions for our nation. That's the essence of how our democracy works. And it operates by leadership or by crisis. 
If leadership is there and willing to take the risks associated with leadership, then we can avoid crisis. If not, we will govern by crisis. And that's largely what we do today. So ultimately, leadership has to step up. I have a young son who just got elected uh, to my old seat in the Congress. Uh, and you know, what, what, he, what he has experienced, and, and he can't plead ignorance because he, he knew he saw me uh, in the Congress. <laughs> uh, but he's a, you know, a veteran from uh, Afghanistan who uh, was able to get elected. And there are newer members up there, Republican and Democrat, many of them veterans, who are frustrated by the dysfunction and the gridlock. And so he's part of a solutions caucus. You know, 22 Democrats, 22 Republicans right. trying to find solutions. I'm afraid what's happened in Washington is not going to change from the top down. It's going to change from the bottom up when we elect a new generation of leaders who want to govern this country and not just fight each other. Well, you were just terrifically on, and thank, thank you. you so much.